Eigentlich geht es eine ganz, geht's um eine ganz einfache Frage. Ähm, wo stecken wir den Stecker zwischen Hirn und, und der Maschine rein? So, wie können wir das Hirn adaptieren? Das ist eine Frage, die Menschen schon ganz lange beschäftigt. Es ähm, gibt viele Ansätze, gibt viel Forschung, es ähm, gibt viele Ideen. Ähm, und wir haben das große Glück, dass, dass Lucy hier ist. Lucy hat in Karlsruhe E-Technik studiert, macht das eigentlich schon immer, so E-Technik, nicht studieren. Und ähm, kriegte dann irgendwann mal so diesen einen berühmten Anruf, so, hey, hast du nicht Bock zu uns zu kommen? Und dann ist sie aus Karlsruhe leider weg und ist nach SF gezogen oder in die Richtung und ähm, darf an diesem Thema mitmachen und ist bei Neuralink gelandet. Und äh, das ist jetzt, geht halt eben um, sie, sie erzählt von den verschiedenen Methoden und äh, welche Firmen sich damit beschäftigen. Und äh, ich bin sehr gespannt. Applaus für Lucy. Und enjoy. Yeah, thanks for this wonderful introduction. Um, I'm Lucy, and I'm here to talk about brain-machine interfaces or brain-computer interfaces. These two terms are pretty much interchangeable. You find both in literature. I personally prefer brain-machine interfaces because it's more general than computers, and who knows what the future brings in terms of technology we want to connect to our brain. And fundamentally, the question I want to answer today, or since it's impossible to answer this question in 45 minutes, what I want you to get you started on thinking about is, how do you possibly read from and rate data to the brain? Um, so this is like the outer scope of this presentation, and I want you to, like, as I go through my slides, as I present different technologies, I want you to think about this problem. I want you to connect existing knowledge you might have from engineering or even software development and how knowledge you already know applies to this topic and might provide a solution for some of these challenges. Um, first, I need to clarify what I even mean by data, um, why it is important to communicate with the brain, because obviously we are already doing brain-to-brain -brain communication by me standing here speaking through this microphone. In fact, this is already brain-computer communication. I'm talking to this microphone, my voice is streamed to the internet, someone on a computer is already listening to the signals in my brain, just with all these intermediate layers in between that limit the bandwidth. And fundamentally, what we have today in terms of language that humans use that has evolved over thousands of years of evolution and knowledge is pretty much this graph. You might agree with or disagree with some details, but fundamentally, when we talk about human-to-human -human communication, the speed, like the bandwidth of how fast data can be exchanged is bottlenecked by talking, by speech. Concepts in my head, in my brain, need to be compressed into speech that is then transferred through the modulation of my voice, of muscles, goes through the air into someone's ear and has to be decoded into a concept. Um, this is pretty slow. It works much faster if you don't have this intermediate step of transferring knowledge through body language or speech or um, gesturing. Um, you can imagine things much quicker than you can express them um, hopefully all of you are pretty, uh, some of you might have an inner monologue, some of you might not have an inner monologue, um, independently of if you have like some speech-based inner representation of your, of your consciousness, you almost certainly be able to visualize or imagine emotions or abstract concepts at a much higher bandwidth um, than we can communicate them. Um, this is what we call thinking. And this is what we had for like the past few thousand years with um, spoken language and more recently written language. And now a couple years ago, we introduced these new devices called computers that we also need to interact with, that we also need to communicate with. And the communication, the means of communication that we have accessible today to communicate with computers are significantly worse than what we can do with humans. If you think about human to computer communication, um, if you are like on the internet, if you're composing some post, you're most likely using a keyboard, which is this very slow mechanical thing where you press individual buttons um, significantly slower than talking. And the other way around, luckily, is a little better because humans have this great um, interface with, um, with the environment, um, your eyes. 
um, very high bandwidth into the brain. Uh, we have modern te display technology that can represent display information with up to 4K resolution or even higher. Um, so this, this channel is a little, little better, but it's still bottlenecked. And what virtual reality tries to solve is fundamentally get this bandwidth of human computer communication, computer to human communication, to the same level as nowadays human to human communication is. So all this research that's happening um, with like the metaverse, with like VR glasses, with haptic feedback, is basically trying to replicate the environment we already um, interact with in some virtual reality, in some virtual digital world. Um, where you have access to the full bandwidth of this communication, ideally to make stuff like teaching, and transfer of information, transfer of knowledge, transfer of um, emotions um, easier and more accessible. Um, but this still has this fundamental limit of basically this bottleneck of our brain having to push information through the spinal cord, through muscles, um, in order to exchange this data. So if we at some point want to um, go beyond um, communication speak, uh, speeds that are capable, possible through, through traditional language, we need um, direct read and write access to the brain. And this is essentially what brain machine interfaces try to achieve, is basically pushing the limits of human to human and human computer communication to the fundamental limits of what your brain is capable of processing. Um, and to get an understanding of how we potentially get there in some sci-fi future, we need to understand how neurons work and how they already talk with each other, how this inner thinking works and what we can do with technology to access this data um, for both input and output. And as it turns out, as you probably already know, the neurons in our head already use electrical signals. So evolution millions of years ago already realized that Electric fields are a great way to transfer information. Um, there are tons of physical principles that rely on electric fields to modulate, for example, the ion flow through gated ion channels in the cell membrane of neurons. Um, and just for you to get an understanding, get an idea of like how big these neurons are and what like scale we are talking about, um, this is a screenshot from um, the H01 data set, which was created, brought into existence by the Google Brain project, um, which is this great research project where one cubic millimeter of uh, human donor um, cerebral cortex tissue has been donated and sliced into four nanometer thin slices and fully analyzed, fully, uh, fully um, um, visualized using scanning electron microscopy. Um, to a level where you can like identify and see individual synapses um, to create this, this connectivity graph of how neurons work. And lots of researchers gained tons of valuable insights from this data set. The key takeaway you should get from looking at this is some sense of scale. So when we think about neurons, when we think about neuroscience, neurosurgery, we probably imagine this to be incredibly small. But in fact, a neuron, as you find it in your brain, isn't that small. It's like on the order of 20 micrometers. It has about the same diameter as a human hair. It can be visible to the blank eye or with like some simple optical microscope. In fact, the technology we are capable of creating through microfabrication is significantly smaller than um, neurons in our head. The transistors that you find in your smartphone, in your laptop, um, even the pixels of displays are on the order of dozens of nanometers, multiple orders of magnitude smaller than what biology came up with to do computation. Um, so we already have the technology, we already have the means of creating structures that are on the same order of magnitude or smaller than the kind of stuff that's happening in biology. And um, as I explained earlier, Neurons are already using electrical signals to communicate with each other. Neurons use sodium-potassium pumps to create a gradient and ion concentration between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell, um, which causes a resting potential of about minus 70 millivolts between the inside of the cell and the outside. And as a neuron is triggered, is stimulated by neurotransmitters, um, there's a wave traveling through the neuron. I hope you can see this. The contrast is pretty bad. Um, but you can basically see the voltage potential across the um, cell membrane changing as 
a neuron is triggered and we call this voltage spike a so-called action potential. This happens about 0.1 to 10 times per second for every neuron in your head that's actively involved in some form of communication. This could be thinking, this could be language, this could be motor control. But it, what's important to take away from this, which is also was very surprising to me as an electrical engineer, um, these voltage levels we are talking about are pretty significant. If you're involved in like audio technology in any way, if you like have done um, like, like um, audio engineering or anything with sound, you might realize that this voltage amplitude is on the same order of magnitude as the signals you use in like headphone amplifiers. And in fact, in the 70s and like the early days of neuro research, people would literally stick little needles into the brain that are hooked up to a guitar amplifier and you could directly listen to the clicking noise of individual neurons firing. Um, Obviously, the signal is significantly attenuated as you go away from an individual neuron. And tapping into a neuron with our current technology is very hard. It is possible to do on benchtop, but it is not very feasible for any large-scale electrode array. So the actual signals we're talking about in a second are much smaller. But I just wanted to give you an idea that these signals that are like flowing around in your head are actually pretty strong and significant and can be easily captured by today's um, analog to digital converters. Um, another interesting thing to understand in order to come up with solutions of interfacing with the brain is getting some understanding of how the brain is structured. This is an artistic interpretation of neuron distribution and connection. This is not accurate. This is not an actual brain scan. Um, but what is interesting to take away from this is to realize that the cerebral cortex where the highest level of your consciousness is taking place, um, where neurons are connected um, at the highest density is basically only covering the outer surface of your brain. And this layer of highly connected neurons goes down about three millimeters deep. Um, sometimes this layer goes into like brain, brain folds, which makes it hard to access from the outside. But after all, you don't need to like scan the entire brain if at some point you want to get or build a full brain machine interface. Basically, the outermost layer is sufficient um, to capture everything that happens below in the white matter is mostly responsible for relaying information from and to different areas of the brain or down the spinal cord where it is then distributed through your body and where like sensor signals come back from the surface of your skin. Um, and with this being said, we can dive into different technologies that try to um, read these brain signals, read these electrical signals from neurons. And fundamentally, there are two different approaches to how brain-machine interfaces work. Um, there are technologies that I will talk about in the scope of this talk that directly try to measure this electrical voltage as a waveform. However, there also exists technology um, that is significantly less invasive that tries to um, measure and detect secondary effects from this neural activity, um, like for example, fMRI or FNIR technology, uh, which you probably commonly associate with brain machine interfaces when you look at like, um, I don't know, your brain on acid or something like this, those visualizations where you see different areas of the brain light up. Um, these are usually fully non-invasive scans of the brain that detect secondary metabolic um, processes in your brain based on increased brain activity. So if some area of the brain has show, is showing an increased activity, it might increase in metabolism, oxygen concentration, the blood in this area of the brain goes down, and this can then be detected by um, a sensitive fMRI scanner. Um, however, this is not the kind of technology I want to focus about in this talk because the problem of this technology is that since it is a secondary process, the reaction to brain activity is very slow. So it takes some time for byproducts to build up that are then detected. And I personally think for this to become relevant in our modern technology, you need to directly look at the electrical signals in the neurons or generated by the neurons. And this being said, I want to um, separate these types of brain-machine interfaces that directly measure electrical signals into three more types, ranging from non-invasive technology to um, minimally invasive technology to fully invasive technology. 
And the most simple brain machine interface that you might have already, that you might have already tried personally on yourself um, are so-called EEG sensors. Um, these are sensors that you basically stick on the outside of your head, on the skin, and you're measuring the voltage of a whole bunch, thousands of neurons firing at the same time or at similar time intervals. And this superimposed um, firing of neurons causes some large scale voltage difference. We call these local field potentials that can be strong enough to translate travel all the way through the skull and be detectable using very sem sensitive amplifiers on the surface of your skin. And the obvious advantage with this technology is it's non-invasive. You can just put on those electrodes. Some of them are not even sticky. They literally just make contact with the surface of your skin. You can read signals, and if you are done with your session, you can take the brain machine interface off. The big disadvantage with this technology is um, A, the signals are very weak, and B, you don't have high spatial resolution. Because as you can imagine, by the time all these superimposed electrical signals make its way through the non-conductive skull, they are mixed together. Um, you only see very significant brain activity. You don't have good spatial or temporal resolution. And this gets a little better as you go below the skull, below this like insulating layer that nature put in place to protect the very thing that we try to access. Um, which are so-called ECOG arrays or electrocortical um, graphy um, arrays, which are two, usually two-dimensional structures that you place, lay on top of the surface of the brain, or to be more precise, on top of the dura, which is an additional um, separating layer between the brain and the bone, um, which separates basically um, the uh, fluid that's surrounding the brain from the environment. And by not penetrating this dura, you greatly reduce the risk of an infection, of an actual brain infection. This is why this is called minimally invasive. All you need to do is to make an incision, um, cut a hole in your skull. You can place this electrode array on top of the dura without actually damaging any of the brain structure. You close this incision, this uh, cranatomy back up, um, and you're pretty much done. And the advantage with this is you get significantly stronger signals and you're much closer located, but every single electrode is still recording from multiple hundreds of thousands of neurons. And if you want really high spatial resolution, if you want to decode individual muscle movement in the motor cortex, if you want to stimulate individual pixels of your visual field, you really need to talk to single neurons. And for this, you unfortunately, as it stands right now, need to stick needles into the brain. And this is what we call brain penetrating um, microelectrodes. Um, and these today form the most advanced technology of brain machine interfaces. And I will, I will show you a couple in a second. Um, so this is pretty much the biological background you need to know to understand why it is so hard to interface with the brain. First of all, the signals we are looking at are pretty small, and they are in a very hostile environment. The body is very good at protecting itself. Everything you put in is recognized as a foreign object by the immune system. So interfacing with neurons is pretty much a material science problem and a minimalization, miniaturization problem where you want to make electronics as small as possible, as energy efficient as possible, to create the smallest possible damage to healthy, healthy brain tissue. And this is what brings us to the so-called con congestion problem, um, which you will understand in a second. So first of all, uh, back to EEGs. Uh, one noteworthy platform is the so-called OpenBCI project, and I highly recommend you taking a look at it. Um, this is a really cool open source project started in 2013. Um, it's fully open source soft uh, software and hardware. Um, that provides these eight channels, high gain EEG channels on a circuit board that provides wireless connectivity. Um, the authors of this project provide uh, 3D files to print your own little head with electrodes um, to like wirelessly record and stream this data. And what's really cool about this is since it is open source software, you can easily script it and design your own studies. So for example, on this screen on the right, um, you can see how someone used Arduino to script a experiment where um, the person wearing this B 
BMI is instructed to move the right finger. And at the same time, you can look at these local field potentials at these like um, broad signals that are picked up on by the electrodes on the surface of, of the skull. And this works great for some applications, specifically if you don't care about um, very precise um, movement intentions, if you don't care about high fidelity information, high fidelity data, if you want like wipes rather than data, this is great. There are many commercial products using this technology that focus on um, concentration, that try to give the user feedback on how well they're focusing on a specific task. Um, so for stuff like this, or for, for sleep tracking, for example, this is great if you want to um, detect different phases of your sleep. This is great technology, but it doesn't get us to a point where it's actually um, benefiting or like increasing the bandwidth of communication we have available compared to a keyboard where you can literally type. This brings us to um, the category of minimally invasive um, brain-machine interfaces, and one noteworthy company in this field is Synchron, uh, which came up with this great idea of using a stent, which is an existing medical product used for like multiple decades at this point, that can be inserted through endovascular tissue, through your veins running through your body, because some of these end up in your brain, so you can get electrodes all the way through your neck into the brain into specific areas, and you can probably see this wire of one of these dendrodes running up um, this, this endovascular tissue all the way up in the motor cortex without making an incision, without being invasive into the head. And this solves a bunch of problems that we have of EEG. We are much closer, we are much, in much closer proximity to the actual neurons. We get much stronger signals. But the big disadvantage remains that we record from multiple hundreds of neurons per electrode. So we can't really differentiate between um, specific movement intentions, specific like visual, visual stimulants, specific emotions potentially in the future. And um, to give you an example of what we can do with this technology, this company started clinical trials as of this year. And one um, application they're currently demonstrating is um, for patients with paraplegia who are basically paralyzed down their neck. Um, these patients to interact with computers usually use iris trackers um, since they still can move their eyes to move around the cursor on the keyboard. But to press buttons, they have to do this very annoying gesture where they move their eyeballs into one corner of the screen and look there for a specific period of time to basically click. And what this BMI enables for these patients is to perform this click action and a secondary zoom action by thought alone without actually moving their eyes to perform this action. And this already, albeit for like fully abled people, seems like not that big of a deal, is a great improvement of quality of life for people who are living with disabilities. Um, similar approach um, of like helping people with paraplegia was taken by BlackRock Neurotech. Um, you see, we get progressively more invasive and it becomes progressively more scary. Also, <laughs> I guess I forgot to mention this, it was in the abstract, uh, but trigger warning, there will be pictures of actual brains over like the next couple slides. So if you're like sensitive to seeing blood, um, you probably want to leave now. Um, it's, I don't know, uh, just putting it out there. Um, so this is, this is the first company from all the companies that I presented um, that aims to drill a hole into your skull and uh, the reason they do this is because they um, developed, they invented the so-called Utah ray. The Utah ray is a piece of silicon that's manufactured using traditional microfabrication technologies that we have available for semiconductors for over 30 years now. And it's using silicon substrate to 3D structure these little needles that you can see on the right. And each little needle is incredibly thin, it has a di diameter of only three, three micrometers. And every single, this, this, this specific Utah array has a total of 256 channels um, that are connected to physical wires that go to a percutaneous connector that basically provides connectivity between these individual electrodes and um, the surface of, or the outside reading device. 
This company has not yet achieved to make a fully implantable device. Um, so you have this connector that's not only awkward, but also very dangerous since it provides additional risk for infection um, for study participants. This product was never commercialized, but it was used in, as part of the BrainGate study, which was a very successful research study running since 2009 to get us the first real data from using brain-machine interfaces with humans. And on the next slide, I want to show you one of these research participants um, who is also a paraplegic patient who has not been able to use computers with high bandwidth other than through iris trackers or like a little like joystick you control through blowing into a little straw. And in this video, this patient is using this um, BlackRock um, brain-machine interface that's implanted into the motor cortex to move around the cursor and actually perform typing actions with their thoughts alone. Which is really impressive, I think. Um, this was after 1,001 days of this clinical trial that's been running since 2009, and it's been hugely successful. Um, unfortunately, one problem with this technology is um, not only do you need to cut a hole into your skull, on top of this, albeit each single of these electrodes is very small, the combined surface area of all these electrodes together is pretty big, and you actually need a little uh, pneumatic piston to, to ram this microelectrode array into the brain without causing too much trauma, um, simply because the force required to insert it is so high. Also, since they're all connected, you can't really avoid um, all the vessels on the surface of the brain. So during the insertion, you're getting a lot of bleeding. And this brings us to the congestion problem, which I mentioned earlier. Current technology, one bottleneck with this approach is that for every neuron you're recording from, you're killing about 100, which is not great if you eventually want to scale this technology to a point where we want to record from 10,000s, hundreds of thousands of neurons, because it would mean that you're also destroying a significant part of your healthy tissue. Um, which brings us to Neuralink, which is a company that tried to, or at least minimize the impact of this problem through um, not having a single rigid electrode array, but by distributing all these electrodes through a flexible um, electrode structure. And um, Neuralink has been very successful in making a fully self-contained device. Um, unlike BlackRock Neurotech, uh, where you have this external wired connector, all the electronics of the current um, neural interface that Neuralink is working on is self-contained in a single um, hermetically sealed package which has a bunch of advantages. First of all, you can fully explant it under your skull. Um, so there's reduced risk of infection. Um, also, um, data compression of the actual neural recording happens on the device itself. So the bandwidth of data you need to transfer to your computer or the device you want to control using this BMI is significantly lower, which enables the use of Bluetooth wireless technology to stream out this data. But the real secret source of Neuralink um, are these threads. And here we are looking at like a 3D rendering or like a um, large scale view, zoomed in view of one of these um, electrodes. Um, I guess you can't see the human hair for scale, but luckily there are these error indicators. You can tell it's much smaller than a human hair. Um, this is one single of the 96 threads that are connected to the Neuralink device. Each thread has a total of 16 electrodes. Um, that each have about the size of one neuron. So these are about 10 by 20 micrometers in size, which is roughly the same size as a human neuron in the cerebral cortex. Um, and these electrodes are manufactured also using a traditional semiconductor um, um, wafer as the bare substrate, which enables the use of existing fabrication technology to spin code, for example, um, the main isolator, which is polyimid onto the wafer, and build the metal structures on top using sputtering processes that you commonly find in the semiconductor industry. Um, and unlike the Utah array, where you have to insert the full 
thing all at the same time, um, thereby introducing a lot of trauma to the brain. Um, Neuralink developed um, this R1 surgical robot, which is basically a fancy pick and place machine kind of thing. Um, it has this little, it has this little um, needle cartridge that contains a very thin tungsten wire. And maybe you've noticed the top of each of these electrodes has a little loop. Um, and the needle that goes into this cartridge basically hooks into this loop, pulls one thread at a time out of this or off this silicon carrier, off the silicon substrate, and places it into the brain once at a time. Um, so basically, the workflow during the surgery looks like this. You open the skull, drill like a hole about the size of the Neuralink implant, which is about 20 millimeters in diameter. You insert these threads one by one, and then the hole in the skull is replaced by the actual implant, which contains the battery, electronics, radio, and so on. And then you close the incision. And the robot is using optical um, image recognition to target these loops, hooks onto the loops, peels them off the silicon substrate, and is inserting them into the brain one by one. And it kind of looks like this. So you can see. Um, in addition to like optical imaging, this robot is using optical coherence tomatography to actually look deep down into the brain tissue um, where it aims to implant. And using, again, um, image recognition, it's actively avoiding hitting vessels. So you're still targeting one specific brain region, but you can be much more precise about not um, damaging healthy tissue. And once you have all these electrodes inserted in your, into your brain, uh, total of 1,024 electrodes in this case, um, you can actually do quite a lot of stuff. Um, so currently Neuralink is also trying to provide a medical product for people with paraplegia, which means the main brain area um, they are targeting is the motor cortex. Um, because turns out people living with paraplegia usually get their spinal cord injury um, through a accident. So there's a physical disconnect in the spinal cord, but their brain is still fully developed. When they think about moving their arm, when they think about moving their thumb, there are still neurons in the brain firing that would relay this information to the actual muscles. And by recording um, the neural spike patterns from this area of the brain and sending it through an artificial neural network that then interprets these signals um, to intended movement, we can recreate um, this intended movement using a cursor on the screen or potentially provide people with um, prosthesis or have them control the wheelchair. Um, Neuralink currently does not yet have approval to start their clinical trial with humans. Um, however, you might have already seen um, this video of a non-human primate uh, which is implanted with a Neuralink who uses this implant to control the cursor on the screen. So what you can see here is the monkey is sitting in front of the screen. And at this point in the video, the monkey is using this analog joystick to control the cursor on the screen. However, at the same time, data from the monkey's motor cortex is recorded and streamed wirelessly to this decoder algorithm. And the decoder algorithm is associating the neural spike pattern it is seeing with the intended movement by this monkey. And here you can see like the raw neural spike data that is streamed to a computer via Bluetooth. Um, every line in this like plot is basically one channel, and the white white pixel means there has been a spike detected within this um, time interval. And now you can see you can unplug this joystick, and using the output from the decoder algorithm, the monkey is still able to play the game using just its mind alone. And actually, the hard part with this research is to now teach the monkey that it can play the game without using the joystick. Since it's still, <laughs> since it's still trying to like, use the thing, it, it takes a while for them to understand that it takes their mind alone to move this cursor on the screen. And since it's a universal input device, um, you're not only limited to like, this specific tile game. You can actually teach monkeys a whole variety of different games. So. <laughs> In this, in this example, in this example um, they are controlling one of the pedals playing against the computer. 
using just this brain implant alone. And this is pretty much the state of the art of the technology we are right now. Um, obviously, it's like impossible to tell what would happen if we put this technology into humans. Um, but since monkeys are very similar in their psychology to um, physiology to humans, it is expected to see similarly um, effective results where in hopefully the very near future, we are looking at uh, people um, living with disabilities finally being able to control a cursor again um, with like significantly higher bandwidth than what they can currently do using iris trackers. And in some very far sci-fi future, hopefully um, you would also be able to use this, make this technology attractive for fully abled people to increase the connectivity of like people in the world through the internet. And there are like plenty of companies that all try to aim the same thing. And the other message I want to give you in this talk is um, unfortunately, like technol this technology has like huge potential, but as every technology, specifically in capitalism, it also has a huge abuse potential. And I think this crowd in particular, this audience, and I'm really happy to being able to have this presentation uh, here at GPN, is very well aware of all the potential security problems of all the, put, like, I'm, I'm, I'm sure every one of you like talking about this thing is coming up with like the worst case nightmare scenarios of how this technology could be terribly abused. And I think this is very important. Um, and if I want to like give you one message and if you like, if, if I made you curious for this technology fundamentally, I would encourage you to like do some reading, do some research, see if this is something that potentially interests you in your professional career and join one of these companies. Because I think this crowd of people is a very special crowd of people that is both very competent in terms of technical skills, but also has extremely high ethical standards. And this is something that will become incredibly important with this technology. So why is this important? Why do I talk about this now? Uh, we probably all know Moore's law for semiconductors where every two years we are doubling the computational power of semiconductors of microchips. Turns out kind of the same thing is happening with brain machine interfaces where as our capabilities in microfabrication, our capabilities in making efficient semiconductors is increasing. We are developing new battery technologies that enable higher energy density to actually put compute into the human body. Um, we can see that in fact, the number of simultaneously recorded neurons also is doubling about every two to three years. And this graph ends in 2020, but as of 2022, we are at about 10,000 neurons we can record from. And in like five years, this is very likely to be on the order of 100,000 neurons. And at this point, this technology does actually become attractive to be used for virtual reality applications. And moving even further in the future, I can very well see this technology becoming mass adopted as the basically successor of the smartphone, where this is technology that becomes so cheap and so commonly available that people decide to use this for communication. And at this point, data security, um, ethical concerns, accessibility become very important, and I all want you to be not afraid, but aware and curious for this technology and make sure we are doing it right. Thank you, this was my presentation. Um, I think I have plenty of time left to answer a whole bunch of questions. So um, let's have some discussion about this. Yeah, thank you. Wir haben ungefähr 20 Minuten Zeit und Um, thank you. I wanted to ask about the other way, other way around. So you talked a lot about transferring information from the brain to the outer world. Um, what's the state of the art um, 
for transferring from the outer world into our brain? Or is there some, some research already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in fact, um, I can only talk about um, the Neuralink implant because I'm deeply involved with design of this, this device. And um, this, is, this isn't news. Neuralink is publishing a bunch of papers about their technology. And uh, one thing our ASIC team is very proud of is the capability of having full stim capability per channel. So not only um, on this application-specific silicon that connects to these individual uh, neurons, there's an ADC analog to digital converter connected. There's also a stim engine connected, which is basically a digital to analog converter with an amplifier that is capable of generating arbitrary waveforms on each and every of these electrodes. And this is something we currently have disabled for our studies. But in the future, this becomes more and more interesting to involve into applications like, um, like um, um, visual like prothesis, where you can potentially restore vision without uh, using a retinal implant. Um, the whole thing with STEM is um, you need a significantly higher channel count in terms of electrodes to actually do anything useful other than causing some uncontrolled muscle twitching. Um, so we are not quite there yet, but it's certainly something that's already explored and taken into account when making these designs. Okay. Uh, hello. Um, my question is uh, more related to the operation because it is an invasive surgery, so uh, how do you address scarring of the tissue, like with drugs or uh, with the uh, elements used in the uh, electrodes? How do you do that? Yeah, so I think there are two different types of complications or um, scarring that can occur. Um, obviously, there's the surgery itself, um, which poses some amount of risk since you're opening the skull, um, you're introducing something into the brain. Um, and this is like a whole process you need, you still need, even with this robot, you still need a neurosurgeon to perform all the like manual uh, work. And there are risks associated with this, but these are pretty well addressed through traditional medicine. So um, generally you have about the same risk of infection as you have with every in in incision. Um, and I think this is mostly addressed through medicine and antibiotics antibiotics. Um, the second part of the question aims on what happens with the material once it's inside the brain. And this is where biocompatibility really comes into play. And the key here is to basically make use materials um, the brain or the immune system doesn't recognize as foreign objects by making them as bioidentical as possible. So with these threads specifically, there's research going or generally with like brain machine interfaces or any implants in biotech in general is to functionalize the surface of the silicon material or this polyimid material using peptides that are um, bioidentical. So your immune system sees these electrodes or sees these structures and doesn't necessarily recognize them as something that needs to be attacked by the immune system. And with such special coating, with such functionalization, you can reduce the scarring that occurs around a fine object significantly. Um, yeah. Thank you, first. Um, for the question, um, it's known that the brain is learning um, from when, it when it's used in a certain area. Is there anything that shows that it's um, learning from the way of connecting to that device? So um, if you check that monkey, would it actually show any improvement um, in the area where it's connecting? Um, this is a great question. I was hoping something like this comes up because now I get to tell a little story that really fascinated me um, about like how the, how how um, pla like how adaptive the brain really is, and this has nothing to do with brain machine interface as well to some degree, um, but in fact, one thing that happened to me that really changed my my view about these things and why I'm like now so excited for this technology, really think it will be successful in the short term, 
is after the pandemic, when I moved to the US, I was meeting with a friend um, who I haven't seen for a long time, who is very active in the furry community. And um, this friend, furries in general are a really interesting social group because they usually happen to be people with high tech salaries. So they have access, easy access to new technology, but they are also um, often socially isolated or prefer to engage in their own social groups, which is why furry conferences are a thing. But during the, the pandemic, there weren't much conferences happening. So a lot of furries really got into virtual reality stuff. And one specific application a lot of my friends um, used to stay in touch is VRChat. And in VRChat, um, you get to customize your avatar um, and you get to um, program custom geishas that are detected and tracked using, for example, the Valve Index virtual reality glasses. So this friend had a custom skin where they could wick their tail or like control their, their ears movement using these gestures. And I was, and this person has been using VRChat for like over a year, every day, multiple hours a day to like stay in touch with their friends. And I was meeting them at a restaurant, obviously without any of their VR headset. And I was talking to them. It was one of the first interactions we had in person after the pandemic or after like vaccines became available. And I was talking to them, just having a casual conversation and they would do this thing with their fingers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was asking them, hey, are you, are you okay? Are you having a stroke or something? And, <laughs> and they were like, oh, Oh, this is how I show excitement using, <laughs> using, using my ears in VR. So within a year, within less than a year, they rerouted their body map. Their brain learned to express emotions, not only through skin muscles, but also through like thumb muscles. And if you apply the same to a brain machine interface that's implanted in this area of, of, of your brain, you could imagine that even using existing technologies, we might already be able to express emotions digitally using this technology, which is very exciting to me. Um, the fact that you can do so much just through um, rerouting your brain and, and learned behavior. So I, I hope this somewhat answers your question. Um, um, so about the bandwidth, as I understand it right now, you are... I use uh, so you are using pattern recognition in some way to associate nuance firing with hand movement. Do you think that with uh, putting feedback back into the brain that maybe the, the brain activity could be rewritten so it doesn't depend on like patterns that are used for handwriting so that you can increase the bandwidth with, or maybe with finer gesturing, like imagine like you were soldering, not like moving a joystick. Could you imagine that the bandwidth would be higher if you try to remove the hand movement part from the entire ah. brain computer interface? Um, so I can show you this slide, which is quite interesting, which basically shows how the decoding currently works. This is so currently decoding this motor movement, this thumb movement in case of the monkey is actually very simple transformer. What you're looking at here is basically a map of these threads um, as they are inserted. Each thread has 16 um, channels as you go down and color coded, you can basically see how much neurons in this area of the motor cortex are contributing to movement in one specific direction. Um, so as we gain more knowledge with neuroscience, and this is actually one thing that's kind of annoying with the work we do, is we have this very powerful tool to record neural activity, but actually we have no idea what's actually happening um, on any abstraction layer in the brain that goes below the actual direct movement and stimulation of muscles. So, but as we gain like more insights into what all these dots do that do not significantly contribute to the obvious movement, we can write newer decoder algorithms that become much better at interpreting not only actual movement, but also intended movement and like movement trajectories that your brain imagines as it thinks about moving a curse in a specific direction. And then the other aspect to this is how can we come up with language that is suitable to compress abstract information into 
whatever language we will have using BMIs. And we already see some of this development with the internet where language you use on the internet in chat rooms is very different to language that you use to communicate with people. Um, we as a species came up with emojis as some form of representing emotions through ASCII characters. And I think something very similar will happen with brain machine interfaces where we have this new tool available for communication and we will find higher and higher more efficient ways to express ourselves through this new technology. Yeah. Um, so my question is uh, not really a technical one, but uh, you work for Neuralink, which is uh, owned by the single richest individual in the world. And uh, all the research you quoted is not really public research, but research by private firms. Do you uh, see any problems there? And do you have any idea why all the research is not funded by public institutions, but rather by private uh, capitalist companies? Well, that's a fundamental problem with financing in academia in general, where um, Research in academia and research in private companies have very different incentives. Um, obviously, academia tries to make knowledge accessible. Meanwhile, a private company tries to make a profit. Um, and for some companies, those are not necessarily in conflict. In fact, Neuralink is um, publishing a lot of their research through papers. Um, basically, everything I presented in this talk is public knowledge that's out on the internet. Um, there are plenty of papers that talk about the specific digital architecture of these chips. Um, it is, yeah, it, it, it is fundamental, like it is a problem. The way I see it is in public research, there's not sufficient funding to make this technology happen. I really deeply care about this technology coming into existence because I think it will be very important for the digital age and um, it can, it has huge potential to really benefit people. Um, immediately, as soon as this technology becomes available. Um, so I'm trying to optimize for, I want to see this happen in the world, what is the shortest path? And unfortunately, with like how economics work these days, this is through private companies. Um, but I hope as this technology becomes more accessible, um, there will be a community very similar to how um, the hacking community, the electronics community works today, where uh, private individuals become interested in this technology, reverse engineer this technology, and publish stuff under open source licenses um, that is then available to everyone. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, I just have a more practical question. Mm -hmm. Did you do any degradation studies on the implant? Degradation? Well, I, I personally am an electrical engineer. Um, but yeah, this is, this is certainly something that is happening in pretty much every company that makes uh, bioimplantables. Um, there's a technique called accelerated lifetime testing, where you're basically exposing your materials and your fully assembled devices to an environment that's even more aggressive than um, the brain. So in the case of a um, neural implant, this would be some environment where you're having a very high ion concentration um, very high oxygen concentration like um, hydrogen peroxide solution that is heated to a temperature way above body temperature, um, like 60 degrees C. And within this environment, as you operate devices, you are exposing them to an environment that is accelerating the aging of materials by a factor of four to five. So by having your device in the solution, in this accelerated lifetime testing environment for three months, you're effectively simulating the degradation over one year. And this is the most common technology that's used to see how, how materials would fail um, in, in a patient. First of all, again, thanks for the talk. Uh, same kind of question as uh, before, but not uh, confined to the technical aspects. Uh, these implants, at the moment, I assume it's uh, their life, intended lifetime is for the study for a few, maybe a few years. But if we, if we start to uh, implant them in hu humans, uh, they will stay there for a long time. Uh, is there already um, research in 
in the technical aspects, but also in the social and economic aspects of how do we make this in a safe way, economic way, but also re in respect of human rights. Yeah, absolutely. So what you're ex addressing is upgradability, I think, fundamentally. So um, I compared this technology with smartphones earlier between, because I believe this already is a brain machine interface that every one of us uses. But as this thing gets outdated, you just throw it away or like recycle it and you get a new like higher performance device. Obviously, that's very difficult if the thing is literally in your head. And there's no obvious solution on how to address this. Obviously, making the device as explantable as possible is like one design goal, which is advantageous for a variety of reasons. Also, if there are any complications, the device fails, for example, you would want to explant it safely, uh, which also goes into the direction of biocompatibility, making materials that are like biologically inert and do not actually form scar tissue around them, so you can easily pull them out. But um, yeah, this is, this is one unsolved problem. And it is questionable if this technology will even be mass adopted at all, as long as it is necessary to undergo surgery. Um, obviously, ideally, we would discover some technology that enables um, to read neural signals um, using very sensitive um, Hall effect sensors or something like that. Um, Currently, this is the only approach we have. Um, I, I unfortunately do not have an answer to this problem. If you come up with some idea on how to make this upgradable, please let me know. I'm really curious. Um. Yeah, so on that issue, like, what do you think uh, in like practical use uh, would be the limiting factor to the lifetime of it? Would it be degradation of the electrodes, for example, due to the like uh, iron uh, conditions uh, in the brain, or would it be like failure of the actual electronics, like the battery degrading, or I don't know, like uh, electron migration inside the ASIC or something like that? Yeah, I think, I think it's both. So scar tissue is certainly a concern where. Um, currently with these devices, as you leave them implanted, um, the body is still showing some immune reaction and the way for the body to address a foreign object inside the tissue is to encapsulate it. So it's not getting infected or anything, but the body is like aggravating cells around it, which increase the impedance of the electrode and thereby the signal you're recording is lower. So the device doesn't fail in like a bad way, but it becomes less and less useful as like the signal to noise ratio goes down. The other concern, yes, battery. Like this is, all of these devices are using lithium ion batteries since those are the most advanced battery technology we have available right now. So you get around 500 to 1000 charging cycles before capacity goes down, which with daily use gives you like two or three years. Um, yeah, that's, that's some fundamental limit we currently have with with, with all variable technology. Um. Ich, ich würde sagen, wir haben noch eine kurze mm -hmm. Frage, Zeit. Um, you talked earlier uh, to one of the questions about uh, decoding these uh, spikes that we're recording. And uh, so far we've been doing that for motorics and that's been working uh, well, as you can see from the videos with the monkey. Um, I'm wondering what the developments are in um, decoding actual thoughts, or if consciousness is a nut, we're still going to have to crack before we can like think, uh, send message to Alice. <laughs> um, I think this is this is a question for academia. This is a question where uh, we as companies can provide tools that are then used by researchers to study actual science. Um, the way I see this technology is we are building the microscopes that are then used by researchers to understand consciousness. Um, we do not have any bandwidth or interest to actually dig down into decoding thoughts. We are making the devices that make it possible to examine the working of the brain. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's the approach there. Um, I think we have no idea how the brain is working right now. Ja, danke. Ähm, Applaus. Applaus